generations to come. Good afternoon. It's Wednesday, March 15th at 2.30 p.m. in the East Coast. And welcome to another edition of the TDN Writer's Room Podcast. I'm Bill Finley. I'm a correspondent with Thoroughbred Daily News. And I also do the Down the Stretch show on Sirius XM Radio. And want to remind you that our podcast is sponsored each week by Keith. Hey guys, I'm Randy Moss with NBC Sports, and also I'm on the uh, the Buyer Speed Figure team as well. Zoe Cameron with XBTV, First Racing, and Santa Anita. There is no doodle in the background. I'm at OBS Sales. We just got done with day two of the Breeze Show. I'm obviously representing Mr. Nile Brennan. The barn is right over here. And it was cold early, but it's starting to warm up. It's going to be a lovely day here in Ocala. Yeah, Zoe, you look like you're checking in from the North Pole with that... Uh... Park on and everything. Wait, that must be I must be chilly in, in Ocala today. I took oh, off yeah. layers already. It was really right. cold this thing. Stay warm, Zoe. Uh, so speaking of Florida, last weekend in Florida, not too far from Ocala, at Tampa Bay Downs, the biggest race of the week was the Tampa Bay Derby. Everybody getting excited, of course, about the road to the Triple Crown. And the main attraction was Tapit Trees. We've now decided that, that is indeed the pronunciation uh, of uh, trice. Uh, trice. trice, okay. Trice. I can't uh, tap it trice. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Thank you, Randy. You've been the official uh, source on that from day one. And it, it was um, he did win, uh, but it was a race that people, a lot of people, looked at from kind of opposite views. Some didn't like the race at all. Some thought it was actually quite good. Some were in between. Um, he only got an eighty-eight buyer number. That's nothing to write home about. And the way the race developed. Uh, it looked like he was beaten almost the entire way until maybe about uh, about the 16th ball when he finally took off. He was hard ridden for about five eighths of a mile by Luis Saez. So it was not a win that was comfortable. It wasn't like Forte the week before where you could just say, wow, everything went perfect. It was a win that I thought was, you know, hard earned. I think he'll move forward off of it. Was it good enough to win the Kentucky Derby? No. But. He didn't have to win the Kentucky Derby in March at Tampa Bay Downs. It's got eight weeks from there to go. Randy, what did you think? Well, I think there's such a divergent opinion about the race because there are different, legitimately different ways that you can look at it. Uh, the figure, no, was not that good. But Tappet Trice was visually very impressive once he got into gear. And that wasn't until about the quarter pole. Uh, you pointed out Luis Saez. He was slapping him on the shoulder. Uh, in the run to the first turn, because even though he didn't really break that slowly, he just had absolutely zero interest the first part of the race, zero speed, whether it's interest or whether it just takes him a while physically to get going, I don't know. But Saez was really riding him for a lot longer than you would like to see a good horse have to be ridden. He's obviously got a ton of talent. My primary concern for Tappet Trice as it pertains to the Kentucky Derby, is that in a 20-horse field, horses that do well in the Kentucky Derby come from behinders, tend to be horses that are handy. That, because a hole develops, and Zoe would know more about this than, than either of us, in the Derby, it doesn't last very long because you have so many horses. You have to have a horse that's almost immediately responsive to hit those holes when the opportunity presents themselves. And Tappa Trice in the Tampa Bay Derby looked anything but immediately responsive. He looked like the kind of horse that you're going to have to park on the outside and hope that you don't go six or seven wide and just let him get up, uh, you know, gather up a full head of steam. And it's awfully tough to win the Kentucky Derby like that. I think that's why people were looking at him or talking about him as more of a Belmont horse. That and the fact that it's Todd Pletcher and the son of Tappet uh, than a Kentucky Derby horse. Zoe, what do you think? Yeah, and Todd's already mentioned that he's most probably his derby horse as well, which never instills the greatest of confidence in anyone if you're talking before the derby about the Belmont. Um, I think he's like a bicycle. You have to pedal. You know, we'll hear from Kieran a little bit later, Kieran McLaughlin, who's the agent for Luis Saez, and, and he's going to pretty much say the same thing. And what you mentioned about the hole and having to be handy the hole's going to be moving a little bit faster than he is. If you're pedaling and pedaling and you can't get to the hole, it might be close. And then you've really got to drop down a gear and pedal some more. And I'm not sure he's got the gears. You need a horse that can be stopped and be handy. 
or you're going to run a mile and three eighths, which may be fine because he's definitely bred to run the distance. Uh, he's out of a Dunkirk mare. He ran second in the Belmont Stakes. He's by Tappet, like you mentioned, one of the most successful sires in siring Belmont winners. Um, but yeah, he's, he's going to come running late. He's just going to need a trip and all the luck in the world. And that's what the closers need in the Kentucky Derby is luck. And he's going to need it. No, I, I agree with everything both of you said. But, but my point was, is this necessarily going to be the same horse in the Kentucky Derby that he was in the Tampa Bay Derby? You've got a Hall of Fame trainer who's got eight weeks and one more race in the bluegrass to make adjustments and to tinker with this horse. And, you know, does it have to happen? No, I wouldn't pick him if the Derby will run tomorrow. I wouldn't pick him either. But I think he's going to become, the first Saturday in May, a much better, more focused horse than he was in the second Saturday in March. Possibly. I mean, he's had three starts, and he's been that way in each of his three starts. But that doesn't mean, that doesn't preclude the possibility that he's going to improve between now and the first Saturday in May. We've done this a lot. Uh, over the years. And if there's one thing we've come to understand, it's that we never know as much in mid-March as we think we know about these Kentucky Derby horses as we don't know how much they're going to improve. Yeah, you definitely hit the nail right on the head. What's going to help him, I think, you know, we don't even know if these horses are going to make it to the Derby. Knock on wood, they all do. But I, I think a little bit of action and horses getting wound up, that actually might help him lay a little bit closer and get him a little bit more into the bridle. So if it's going to help anyone, the pomp and circumstance, perhaps it will help him tap it twice. Mm -hmm. The other big news on the road to the Kentucky Derby was the defection of Arabian Knight. Um, he is not seriously injured or anything like that. They're talking about a summer campaign with him. But uh, Mir Zadan, the uh, owner, and Tim Yakteen both said that, you know, just things weren't perfect. And you need things to be perfect to go into the Kentucky Derby. Um, it, first of all, I, I mean, a shame uh, because this horse is so talented and we were really looking forward to what he could do. But I can't say I'm the least bit surprised. Something was going on with this horse. He had that gap with no workouts. I think it was 19 days. Um, Baffert slash Yakteen never even bothered to even nominate either San Felipe or the Rebel. So, you know, there's something was quite, was a miss with this horse. Um, and of course, now, you know, at least Forte is, is the, as we speak, the obvious heavy favorite in the Kentucky Derby. Obviously, that can change between now and Derby Day. But uh, Randy, um, you know, it's a shame to lose Arabian Night, but again, not at least a bit surprised. You know, I mean, based on his normal work pattern, he missed one workout before the weather interruptions at Santa Anita. So that's obviously a cause for concern. You heard all kinds of rumors. He had a temperature, this and that. Uh, but it's unfortunate now that, that he's out. If, if you went back five weeks or so ago, uh, the top three three-year-olds probably, most people would think, in Bob Baffert's barn were Arabian Night, number one, and now he's out. Newgate, number two, now he's out. And National Treasure, number three, who didn't make the San Felipe because of a sore foot. Now, he has come back to work well. He worked uh, Tuesday, this Tuesday, March 14th. He worked six furlongs on 111 and four. I just texted with Tom Ryan of SF Racing, who told me that all systems are go with National Treasure, and he's likely to run next in the Santa Anita Derby or the Bluegrass with Reincarnate penciled in right now uh, in number two pencil for the Arkansas Derby. Those things can obviously change, but uh, the Baffert, now Tim Yak team, three-year-olds have undergone a bit of a shuffle there. Yeah, and don't think Zidane with Arabian Night didn't want to get there. I mean... They must have tried everything and they just finally pulled the plug. So we'll get to see him fight again, which is great. But this just wasn't a case of sour grapes or I don't want to play. It was a case of we don't have enough time. Yeah, and also, as Randy kind of mentioned, I mean, at one point, and this is how, you know, how much fast things can change on the road to the Kentucky Derby. At one point, it looked like Bob Afford had seven or eight just monsters getting ready for the Derby. And now, um, I mean, he, he's if, if – um, National Treasure does make it back. It, it, it's really him and reincarnate. Uh, that's it. Um, I, I don't see anybody else coming out of the woodwork. So, you know, the, the Baffert fortunes have definitely taken a shift. And remember, uh, along with that, uh, Cave Rock, uh, they, they've taken him out of consideration as well. He's just not ready uh, yet. Uh, it took him a little while to get him ready uh, 
after he uh, was put away after the Breeders' Cup Juvenile last year. So um, the other action last weekend involved a really nice performance from Secret Oath in the Azari. And uh, I I didn't think she had a prayer against Clarier. I just think I thought Clarier was a much better horse, faster horse. And, uh, you know, Wayne was talking up about how great she's doing. But Wayne always, Wayne Lucas always, going back 40 years, has been saying this horse has never been doing better, et cetera. Uh, Luis Saez, as we checked in with Karen McLaughlin, took off of Secret Oath uh, to ride Tappet Trice. Trice? Am I going to get this right? Trice. Trice, okay. In, in the Tappet three. Bay Derby. Is oh, three. Yeah, that Tappet. Fletcher, that expensive Tappet horse trained by Todd Fletcher. And he, anyways, but uh, I thought, I, I, Randy, I, I don't know who got the fastest buyer figure of the week. We're going to find out a little bit later in that segment. But the star of the week was Secret Oath. She was really good. She'll go in now to the Apple Blossom. I assume she'll be a pretty solid favorite in there, having beaten Clary Air. And, uh, you know, Wayne Lucas, uh, 87 years old, still gets the job done. Amazing. I mean, I shared your sentiments going into the Azari. Uh, the way Clary Air ran in the Breeders' Cup Distaff defeated Secret Oath in that race. And, you know, the way she was really clicking, it looked like that Clary Air was definitely the horse to beat. But if you watched that race, you watched the Azari, and you didn't know anything about those horses, you would have thought Secret Oath was one to nine, the way she won that race. Tyler Gaffleone just sat on her until about the eighth pole. And then, and then finally, maybe the three sixteenths pole, and then finally gave her a nudge, and she went on and opened up. I mean, she she was a more dominant winner over Clary Air than even the margin would indicate. Uh, now, I obviously for the Apple Blossom, I think we can expect Clary Air to step up her game a little bit. Uh, but I don't know if it's Oakland Park. I don't know if it's the spring of the year. But the best races visually that Secret Oath has run, if you look at her past performances, were at Oaklawn Park last year, and then, of course, the Kentucky Oaks after that. I have a theory on that. She's a okay. she's a busy, busy filly. Like, Dwayne Lucas doesn't miss any dances. This is the beginning of the year. She's never going to feel any better than she feels now. So last year, she made nine starts in 2022. Wayne's not scared of anyone. He's not missing any dances. He wants to go to them all. And I think maybe it took a toll on her. We're early in the year. She's six for 14 lifetime. She got a trouble-free, hassle-free trip over a track she loves in the spring of the year. Spring is in the air, spring in a step. It's funny, I didn't get to watch the race live because I was in the paddock watching the horses come over for the grade one behind hold a mile. And I saw Barbara Banky and I was like, oh, oh, how did you run? And she's like, oh, not not good. We were bottled up the whole way with Clary Air and we couldn't get out in time. And And she came running and she was second and Seeker Oath got the jump on us and ran away. So I put that all in my little brain and went back and watched a replay later. And I'm thinking, even if Seeker Oath didn't get the jump on her, I'm not sure they were beating her on that day at that time. Yes, Clary Air was bottled up. She weaved through traffic under Joel Rosario, but she never got stopped. She kept riding, and the margin of victory was about the same at the quarter pole. So Secret Oath was absolutely amazing and just fantastic for the coach. It's good and, to see that. And the Apple Blossom is probably not going to get any tougher. I mean, I think Clary Air is probably going to be your toughest competition for the Apple Blossom because Brad Cox says that Amore, who won the Beholder Mile you're talking about, is going to run next most likely in the La Troyenne on Kentucky Derby weekend and skip the apple blossom. Really? That's really interesting, because she she was good at Santa Anita. And what did you guys think of the Beholder Mile? Oh, I mean, fun to dream. I thought she was home free at oh. the eighth pole. What and, a game and, she is. Yeah, I mean, you, you, you watch that race, and then in the back of your mind, you know it's Bob Baffert. And, and so she opens up at the top of the lane, cruising at the eighth pole. You think this is over. And uh, Amore just showed continued improvement continued determination and just ran her down on the wire. She's getting better and better with each race she's been running. Well, but fill in the blank it, because her last three starts have been for Brad Cox and he didn't exactly take Amo Ray off of a 4% trainer. The horse was trained by Todd Pletcher. So, you know, Brad Cox, he's got this ability to, to bring out the very best in horses and he certainly has done it with uh, this filly as well. So we'll see how she does down the line. And you, you talked about the La Troya, and we learned last week um, 
that Nest will be in there as well from Micropoli. So that's uh, shaping up to be a, a terrific race. Yeah, uh, and it will be a terrific race indeed. But I believe we were trying to figure out how to pronounce it. So I watched her all summer when my racehorse had her and we got all the works and it was Amo Ray, is all everybody says. It's Amore, like love. Mm. Um, so kudos to the new connections, Hunter Valley Farm. Uh, we'll have a little piece on them just a little bit later on, but it, it really was fun to see. It really, really was. It was a good race. And Baffert's Philly, Cowbird Horse of the Year. Fun to dream. She's a lot of fun to watch and easy to root for. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Keeneland. If you have a calendar ready, mark your calendars for the April Selected Horses of Racing Age sale on Sunday, April the 30th. Kicking off Derby Week in the bluegrass in fine fashion. Entry deadline for print catalog is April the 3rd. Approved supplements will be accepted up until sale day. We'll be right back after this message from Keeneland. If this place could talk, it would roar. It would say, this is racing. This beating heart in the heart of horse country. Steady and strong beneath the roar. Reminding us why. For the love of the horse. For generations to come. The best two-year-old by legendary sire, Quality Road. Get him back, a million five. Very, very impressive debut. Cantering home could not have been more impressive. Coast to coast in the American Pharaoh. He's the real deal. Undefeated and unchallenged at two. He's just too good. He wins the Breeders' Cup Juvenile. Corniche. Corniche, the newest champion to Coolmore, America. The TDN Writers' Room is brought to you by Coolmore at OBS Sales. Let's talk about what's going on at Coolmore. Uncle Mo had his 12th Grade 1 winner over the weekend. We already mentioned her once with Amore, winner of the Grade 1, Behold a Mile. Uncle Mo's six stakes winners in 2023 rank him second among all North American sires so far this year. Amore's dam, Margaret Ray, is going back to a Coolmore sire this year. But this time, she will visit their first year stallion, Epicenter. So some interesting news out of Equibase. And uh, each month they release these figures on how the betting is going. Uh, and it's important stuff for the industry. And basically, through the last couple of years, racing has done fa fairly good. Uh, it's held its own. Sports betting came in. It hasn't wiped anything out. But all of a sudden, in 2023... They're down 6.22% on the year. If that holds up, it'll be the worst year for betting on the sport so far as year-over-year -year decline since 2010. And on top of that, it's not just, oh, we've gotten off to a bad start. Something since October of last year, the numbers were fine going into October, and then they went into a tailspin. Uh, October was bad, November was bad, December was bad, January, February. So, you know, in this day and age, purses are so dependent on casinos and slots and instant racing. I don't think this is uh, something that, that everybody's going to be jumping off the roof over, but it, it's, it is alarming and it is somewhat odd. Uh, you know, what is going on here? And, and Randy, I tried to find some answers to this. I really couldn't find anything concrete. Yeah, the, the, one thing about racing, this data of, of how much is bet, uh, who gets rebates, et cetera, is not available. They just don't make it available to you. But I think it almost certainly has to do something with the computer betters that get these huge uh, rebates. And it's just a guess on my part, but I got to think that they've cut back on their betting for one reason or another. But do either of you have any explanations for this? Hey. We're trying to explain a phenomenon with one hand tied behind our backs, proverbially, right. because there's not any transparency in the industry about these CAW, CRW, whatever you want to call them, computer assisted wagering, computer robotic wagering. That's, that's such a huge part, apparently, of, of all the betting done in this country. You know, I, I don't know why the industry doesn't insist on more transparency 
in this particular situation, because now we're at a spot where obviously, as you pointed out, I mean, there is a drastic difference. You can draw a line uh, from January to September of last year and then forward. From January to September last year, the handle was up one half of 1% for the year. It was kind of up and down a little, but it was, you know, fairly steady at one half of 1%. October down 5%, November 4.5%, December 7.5%, January 7%, February 5%. Very consistent since October, all down between four and a half and seven and a half percent each month. And like you said, there is no logical explanation based on any of the metrics that are made available. Uh, per race day so far this year, it's down eight and a half percent. Per race, it's down nine and a half percent. It's distressing largely because we don't have any idea what's behind it. Yeah, I'm just going to read a few things from Pat Cummings uh, on his think tank because, you know, Pat's on top of this. He knows more about it than probably any of us. And this is what he specializes in. And he's talking about the large betting teams, the CRW and their impact on the sport. And according to his blog, um, he said that Naira has um, restricted the CRWs from pay placing win pool bets within two minutes at the start of races at Naira tracks. They have also banned the CRWs from playing the late pick five, pick six, and cross-country pick five when offered. And he goes on, I'm going to have to read this verbatim, and talk about some of the records that he could find. And he found one from the CHRB. According to the CHRB, the largest CRW team betting on racing in that state is a group that's called Elite Turf Club 17, which handled 20.4 million in 2018 and 22 million in 2019 at Del Mar. But the handle grew to, listen to this, $60 million at the Seaside Oval in 2021. Now, this is just California, and it's almost scary to think. I mean, it, it's good for on-track handle and everything else. But at the end of the day, too much of a good thing can be a bad thing. So here's another, uh, Jerry Brown from Thorograph texted me after I wrote the story. And here's what he had to say. It says, handle is down because CAW is tapping out non-CAW players faster. They have a finite amount to lose and the faster they lose it, the less churn. And in fact, CAW is taking money away from the players and the tracks. I know a lot of guys who have cut way back or stopped entirely like me. Some just play contests. So, uh, you know, and Pat Cummings, if, if uh, you get a chance, if you're viewing our show, please check out uh, Pat Cummings uh, Racing Think Tank. It's got some very interesting statistics on this, including the betting on the Gotham, uh, the, ex uh, the exacta. Now, remember, these guys bet at the very last second. That's what the advantage they have. They get to see what is in the pools. Over a course of 51 seconds, the winning exacta with race came on top went from $138 to seven, uh, 75 cents down to $81.25 uh, $81 and up to those last 51 seconds, only 41% of the total pool was bet at that time. So, you know, and this is something I, I don't know how racing deals with this problem, because on the one hand, these guys bet so much money, you can't ban them. You can't make them go away. The racing needs that handle. At the same time, though, just like Jerry Brown said, they're, you're running the risk of they're making everybody else go broke. Um, if, if, if you divide up the pie and all the biggest slices go to two or three mega computer betters, what's left for everybody else? And, you know, if, if uh, are we going to get to the point someday, Randy, where uh, they run everybody else out of the end. These guys betting against one another. Well, you know, there's a lot to be said about all this. Uh, I share Jerry Brown's sentiments, but is it just coincidence that this hits began in October and before October, everything was just fine? And suddenly in October forward, it's very consistent. You know, in, in your article, Bill, you talked to Mari Wolf, friend of ours who knows a lot about this stuff too. And he theorized that maybe coinciding with October, we don't know because there's no transparency. 
some of the racetracks increase their fees, their source fees, their simulcast fees to the CAWs. It can be 3%, 4%, 5%, depending on the track and their stature. Normally, it's about 3%. Uh, you know, that could conceivably have caused something like this. If we knew, if we had more data, we could maybe make a better guess about it. As far as betters being tapped out, I, uh, competing against the CAWs, I don't really think that that's an issue personally, because from what from everything I've read and everything I understand, the CAW people don't make a great deal of profit on their wagers. Really, what they're trying to do is just break even, as close to break even as they can, so that they can bet a lot of money and then collect on the rebates. It's it's the rebate that is what drives those people and not necessarily trying to beat the races, showing a profit. So I don't think necessarily that they're pulling money out of the pockets of people that are that are betting against them. Uh, I just, I don't know what to think. Now, there have been some changes, Zoe pointed out, but Naira started its restrictions in July of 2021. So all of 2022 was with those restrictions and the handle was going just fine until October. The only track in America that bans CAW or CRW betting is Oakland Park. They will not participate in it. They won't allow them into their pools, directly into their pools with, with a computer hookup. They want to protect their on-track betters because Oakland does more on-track than any major racetrack in America. Um, it's, it's a mystery. Zoe, what's going on in First Things First this week? Oh, first things first, we've got something fun for you. So we did mention, we're, t we're talking a lot about love in this show. Amore winning the grade one Behold a Mile. And I had a couple of good friends in town, Adrian Reagan and John Wade, and I caught up with them directly after the race. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Yeah. You, got, you got Aiden coming in here. Yeah. <laughs> Showing up, taking all the cash. In. All of the cash. All He's of taking all the money. Well, you got her. She's now three for three. I mean, three for three. how bloody exciting is this? Unbelievable. Unbelievable. <laughs> you know, we bought her first stand um, and we weren't really thinking about uh, the run side of it when we bought her. You know, uh, but then... Fergus came in. I remember we were at the sale. Fergus said there might be a bit of run left in it. And a bit? Said, yeah, yeah. First win in the Hunter Valley Colours yeah. in a great one <coughs> event. Great one, yeah. Right here at Santa Anita. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. What's better than that? Doesn't get to the other All right, come no. on, let's go have a drink. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> Yep, and really quiet, yeah. So, yeah. how was it being involved in a great one today? Pretty good. <laughs> oh, I know Bob was good to me. You no, know, Bob was very good to me out here. So. Cheers, lads. There are a million reasons to be at Santa Anita this weekend. Let's start off with Friday, free admission. General parking, $3 beers, I like that, and $5 margaritas. On Saturday, we have the $40 handicapping challenge, and you can win entries into the next $500 handicapping contest. Even if you can't get to Santa Anita, you can bet, and you can bet on first bet. We have the new Coast to Coast pick, five races from Santa Anita, and Gulfstream, the $18,000 pick'em contest, as, long, as well as the $7,500 show Viva. You can play in Santa Anita's free online game by selecting one horse per day to compete for prize money across six different categories. A million reasons to be at Santa Anita. The Lane's End Stallion of the Week is Catalina Cruiser, the son of Union Rags, who was represented by his first crop of juveniles this year, with several of those two-year-olds preparing to sell at the OBS March sale next week, where Zoe is right now. Five-time graded stakes winner Catalina Cruiser has had yearlings sell for up to $320,000, and he stands at Lane's End for a fee of 15 
thousand dollars this year. Yeah, and guys, those two-year-olds look really good. I mean, Catalina Cruiser was fast, right? And he was a scopy looking horse, stood over a lot of ground. I just ran from the breeze show right now. One just whizzed me, whizzed by me, went 10 flat. Um, a half sister to how great is Nate, who of course we just saw lose the jockey. So plenty to love about the Catalina cruisers. They're scopy, they're fast, and they look like they'll go two turns. I got someone here that wants to actually get in on the action over here. Meet rugby and Stephanie oh, Brown. Hey. Rugby is just itching for his TDN debut. I got a cookie here. But... <laughs> Come on, Rugby. Hold on. I got to move. This is Stephanie Brennan. They got lots of horses here in the Nile Brennan shed row. And Rugby is... Oh, come on, Rugby. Don't be a chicken. There you go. I thought you'd have to have a good look Two thumbs up for Rugby. Yeah, yeah, two thumbs up for Rugby. Meanwhile, we'll check in on what else is going on at Lane's Inn. Catalina Cruiser. He won seven of nine starts coast to coast with six triple digit buyers and five dominating graded stakes wins, including a record in the grade two true north stakes, a son of leading fifth crop sire Union Rags, a $370,000 yearling with an imposing physical and one of the best of his generation. There's only one Catalina Cruiser now standing at Lane's End. What makes Woodford special is the attention to detail. Everyone on the team is doing their job. They're well qualified. They show up to work and they work hard and they care about the horse. And I think that's a reflection on uh, John Gleason's program. He gives me good information. He always has, uh, he has a very good understanding of the horse's well-being, where they're at physically and mentally. In equine nutrition, there's a triangle management, genetics, and nutrition. And John's criteria to accomplish that is at the highest pinnacle. I started breaking quarter horses for people when I was 15. You know, people send me quarter horses to break. And that's all I've done, you know, I don't hunt, I don't fish. I focus on training horses. I think about training horses on eating dinner, laying in bed before you go to sleep. And if you roll over in the middle of the night, I think about a horse and it's, you know, it's all consuming. And I think to be successful, it has to be. The TDN Writers' Room is brought to you by Woodford Thoroughbreds. Discover the Woodford Edge. Woodford is a thousand acre world-class facility at Reddick in Florida, just around here somewhere. I don't really know my directions around Ocala, but the Woodford consignment's here somewhere and Reddick's just down the road. Um, they do a great job breeding and selling their own stock, as well as offering breaking and training services to outside clients. It's setting up to be a big spring for Woodford. Derby hopeful Rocket Can and Oaks hopeful Mimi Kazushi were both bred by Woodford, while Oaks bound Hoosier Philly and Derby hopeful Curly Jack were both trained by Woodford. Is this where I drink? We're doing the Woodford drinking game. I need a drink. All right. Uh, also, while we're talking about Woodford, Extra Heat, she is near and dear to my heart. She passed away last week at age 24. She was a Hall of Famer. Woodford purchased Extra Heat privately through the Classic Star Dispersal in 2006, and she spent much of her brood year career there. Condolences to Woodford. And for me, guys, we started our career at the same time. I'm going to age myself. When I was a bug girl at Arlington Park, it was the year 2000. I was 26. Extra Heat was just coming on the scene. She'd won her fi first five races. I was small, like 100 pounds, 20 pounds from what I am now, and she was teeny. And I watched her th throughout her whole career. And I don't know, I just kind of bonded with her. I just thought she was the most awesome little filly. She really was, Zoe. Won 25 black type races in her career. And one of the most amazing parts of the story was she was bought for five thousand dollars at Timonium for a trainer John Salzman Sr. So, you know, uh, what a neat horse, uh, beloved on the Maryland circuit, and uh, very sad to see her uh, pass away. So Extra Heat was obviously very fast. The Fastest Horse of the Week segment, how's that for a segue there, is presented by the Fast Stallions at Windstar, such as the Stallion, who is a stakes winner at two, three, and four, and has his first foals hitting the ground this spring. We'll get to that later. First, fastest horse of the week. 
This is the first week in 2023 without a single triple digit buyer. So the horse at the top of the list is going to be one unfamiliar to most. Malibu Star, who won a starter allowance on Tuesday at Parks Racing by 12 lengths with a buyer speed figure of 98. He now has back to back 98 buyers. Five weeks ago, he won another starter at Parks by nine lengths. Now, the horse may be running against Starter Company right now, but Malibu Star, six year old son of Medallia Doro, was meant to be a pretty good horse. He was originally a Keeneland September yearling for $450,000. Began his career with Bob Baffert in 2019 for Gary and Mary West. He's a half to Arabian Lion, a three-year-old Baffert has right now. And if you look on his pedigree page, you might recognize his third dam. Personal Ensign, Malibu Star is the fastest horse of the week. And now, what about that one star stallion? Independence Hall was an undefeated juvenile, set a new stakes record in the Nashua Stakes, got a 101 buyer in that race. The son of Constitution the next year got a 105 buyer in the Fayette, or that was actually as a four-year-old before retiring to Windstar Farm last year. Independence Hall's first foal is hitting the ground now. Look at them, very nice. And he stands at Windstar for a fee of $10,000. The Green Group is an accounting and tax consulting advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry with more than 500 clients in the horse business, plus proven strategies to save you taxes. You can learn more at www.greenco.com. And we welcome in now the Green Group guest of the week, jockey agent Kieran McLaughlin. He works for Louis Saez, and of course, you know him very well for as a uh, trainer who had a great career doing that as well. Kieran, welcome. And there was a little news in, in your uh, camp within the last couple of weeks, you were nominated for the Hall of Fame the first time you got on the ballot. Your reaction to that? It's a great honor just to be on the ballot. It's a light dream of mine, but it's a, a team effort by so many people, and it's just an honor to be on the ballot. So, Kieran, I know here we are uh, mid-March. I know fans as well as Trainers, jockeys, and agents are kind of focusing on the first Saturday in May, the first Friday in May, Derby Oaks. Let's let's look at a couple of your top contenders right now. Uh, Tappet Trice, who obviously was very impressive uh, winning the Tampa Bay Derby, and now Instant Coffee, I guess, coming up in the Louisiana Derby. Your thoughts on, on those two right now as they stand? Yeah, both of them are very nice Colts. We're happy that they're split up for now. And we'll get to see another race by both of them before we have to make a decision May 6th. Karen, what kind of input does Louis Saez have? Because you two work as a team, but you have a little bit of an edge from other jocks agents, I think at least, because you've been a trainer. Obviously, you're nominated to the Hall of Fame. So congratulations. But do you two huddle together and get together and discuss these horses and make decisions like that? Because you've made some tough decisions in the past. Yes, um, we do. When it's a, a Wednesday at Gulfstream allowance races or maiden races, we don't huddle up. But when it comes to the grade ones and the big races, we definitely talk a lot about each situation. Karen, I want to go back to all your derby mounts, the horses you have lined up. Uh, Randy Metz and Instant Coffee and Tapatrice, but you're also, Luis is the regular rider of Angel of Empire and Litigate. Now, I don't know who's going where uh, necessarily, uh, but there must be some conflicts coming up. Are, among that group, are there any of those horses you will not be riding now? It's possible April 1st, Angel of Empire's Arkansas Derby, and it's a big day in Florida, so we might be stuck in Florida and litigates supposedly going to Louisiana Derby where we ride instant coffee. So we've already talked about Tappet Trice a little earlier in the program and his win in the in the Tampa Bay Derby. I want to get your thoughts on what you saw in that race from Tappet Trice. Because I know as a trainer, I mean, you watch so many horses and you're so good at analyzing and looking at that particular, at, you know, at, at every little thing that we all look at. And Luis well, had to ride, Luis had to ride Tappet Trice pretty hard. For, yes. For, for most of that race. What did you what did you make of that and the horse's development? I want to hope that he gets out of the gate a little better next time. But being that he was slow to break and was last, we stayed out of trouble. We went wide, but he did stay out of trouble. And I never thought he was going to win until the 16th pole when he, when he was there. 
but he's got a beautiful stride, a great mind for a tappet, and obviously Luis has worked him a few times, and now he, that's the second time that he rode him. So he likes him a lot, and and he's uh, he just needs to get in the, get out of the gate a little bit better, hopefully. Is it encouraging that all that happened, and yet he was able to win anyway? Yes, I was pleasantly surprised at the finish, and that he ended up winning by a couple of lengths. So he's uh, he's got all he marks all the boxes for sure. Let's talk about Louis Sayers' boxes. You've been around a, a long time. You were a jockey agent before you were a trainer, which. I didn't realize, but we had this conversation once. What does Louis bring to the table? Because he seems such a level-headed young man that's been through such a lot already. At the death of his brother, he won the Derby. He lost the Derby. He just seems to keep smiling. Yeah, he does. He's very, he's pleasant to work with. We work well together. He never is upset about anything. He's never raised his voice. So it's great to work with him. And if I ask him to get up at 3.30 and drive to Louisville from Lexington to work <laughs> a secret oath, he just says, okay, can you text me and make sure I'm awake? And, and he's there. So he doesn't complain. He's very talented jockey. He surprises me sometimes the way, he, how strong he finishes and how the horses run for him. And he stays out of trouble. And he puts them in the game. He breaks very well from the gate usually. And he, he has them forwardly placed most of the time, so he stays out of trouble. Is that something you took into consideration when you took his book? Because you've been around a lot of jocks and you've seen a lot of jocks. Were there some that you were like, oh, my God, I can't work for that guy. That'll be a nightmare. No, he, really, I, I, he's a top rider. And when Richard DePass said he was going to retire and would I be interested, I pretty much jumped at it just because of, what a great job it is and how talented he is. And it just is a little bit easier than, than dealing with everything that trainers have to deal with these days. Uh, Kieran, he's got the misfortune of crossing the finish line first in the Kentucky Derby in 2019, but of course being disqualified. Now that was before you were his agent, but whether you've had conversations with him about this or not, considering that he's one of what only two jockeys, maybe in the history of the Kentucky, two or three jockeys history of the Kentucky Derby to cross the wire. Uh, first, but not be awarded the win. Do you think that makes the fire burn um, even brighter in, 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 in him right now to get back there and get into the winner's circle in the Derby? Yes, for sure. I mean, that, that's a tough one. He handled it great. He doesn't bring it up. He doesn't. He's not one to look back on anything. He's always looking to next Saturday and the next Saturday and certain horses, but he definitely everybody in the industry wants to win the Kentucky Derby, and for him, I'm sure that he wants to win it more since he lost it. So, Karen, when when you made the decision to switch from training horses to being a jockey's agent, it took a lot of people, I think, by surprise because you were near the top of your profession, witness your Hall of Fame nomination. But you just pointed out yourself, there's a lot of things that go along with being a trainer. I don't think some people really appreciate the challenges of being a trainer in the 21st century. What are some of the things that you miss the most about training and some of the things that you don't miss at all? I miss the horses. I mean, I've been around horses since I was 10 years old and I love being around horses and I love being around the owners and my help. But the regulations, the, the expense of H2B visas and trying to get help and all this hissa now happening is a headache for everybody, you know, that's training horses. So I don't miss that. Karen, what's the hardest part about your job now? Is, is it making the decisions? You had a tough decision with Art Collector. Is, is that one of the hardest parts? Yes, it is. And like we're talking about the Kentucky Derby, the Kentucky Oaks and other big races, that those are the decisions that are very tough, yes. But we're lucky to be in a position that we have a chance to make those those calls. Karen, speaking of that, another conflict came up just last week where you were the regular riders we talked about for Tappet Trice and also Secret Oath, who you won the, uh, Luis won the Kentucky Oaks on. They come up on the same day, Secret Oath in the Azari at Oaklawn Park. Um, I, I, even though they both, they both won, so there was no wrong decisions there, but, um, you know, to, to have to take off a filly of that caliber 
who you won the grade one Kentucky Oaks on. Um, how difficult was that? And has, has Wayne given you any indication that maybe he'll give you the mount back uh, uh, down the road? Throw in Franz Rockett to a golf stream oh, the same right. day. Yeah. So we lost two very nice fillies. But at Derby time, you're always trying to get to the Kentucky Derby. And Wayne was hard on me when I first called him and told him that we were not going to be able to ride her. He said, you're riding the second best one for Todd. What are you thinking about? <laughs> and I said, yeah, you're probably right, but things happen. And we have a great relationship. So he, he got after me a little bit thinking I was making the wrong decision. But then he was fine. He was happy we won and he won. And I was happy he won. And Frank Rockett won also. So everybody was happy. And maybe, yes, there's a chance I'm sure that we could get back on her if someday if Tyler gets tied up. So in your decades as a trainer, you you obviously dealt on a daily basis with jockey agents, uh, sometimes for better, sometimes for worse. How has that helped you now you're on the other side? And you're, and now you're the one that's having to occasionally spin a trainer or, or deal with a trainer in a situation. Yeah, I was the easiest trainer to deal with for agents, I felt like, because I just felt like there's so many top riders where I was. If one can't ride a horse, I'll get the next one. And so I was pretty easy. And it's great. I'm learning who not to give a call to that I can't get off of. So there's certain people that you just can't get off the call. So I'm a little reluctant to give them a call unless I want to ride that horse for sure. So I'm learning about certain people. Will will other trainers bust your balls, Karen? Yeah, do some they, of do them they do. they get on you? Yeah, they do. Some of them do, but not too much, really. It's not bad at all. I get along um, with I most everybody. Yeah, I have one more question. I can remember a conversation that I had with you back in 2019. It was when Mike Smith was supposed to ride Omaha Beach, and he was scratched the day before the Derby, and he picked up the ride on Cutting Humor for trainer Todd Pletcher. And I didn't know at the time that you were a jockey agent before you were a trainer. And you right. looked at me incredulously, and you're like, that's the right call, Zoe. They took Corey Lannery off last minute and put Mike Smith on hot on the heels of winning the Triple Crown on Justify. And I asked you what you thought. You were like, of course, that's, that's the right call. And you it's, still stand by that. Yeah, it's a tough call at times, but you got to go with the best rider on the day for the big races. The best available rider you have to try and get. Do you have a bird in the background? I hear lots of cheeping. Are you, are you in an aviary? No, but I'm just in our neighborhood. In ah, the, the birds are singing. Yes, they are. <laughs> it's nice down here. Well, birds and all, we want to thank Kieran McLaughlin for joining us this week as the Green Group Guest of the Week. Uh, going forward with Luis Saez, best of luck, Kieran, and thanks for giving us some minutes of your time. Yeah, thank you for having us. Thanks. As this week's Guest of the Week, Kieran McLaughlin will receive a free one-hour tax consultation from the Green Group, an accounting and tax consulting advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. Again, you can learn more at www.greenco.com. Are you paying too much in taxes? The Green Group can help. There's a reason the most successful owners, breeders, and horsemen select the Green Group as their tax advisors. They save you money and share successful strategies. Over the past 40 years, the Green Group founder, Len Green, has owned and bred some of the best racehorses in the history of the sport, like Eclipse Award-winning champions Jaywalk and Wonder Wheel. His DJ stable competes at the highest level and has received the game's most prestigious honors. Len Green's in-depth, hands-on industry knowledge, combined with cutting-edge tax-saving strategies, has produced positive results for his clientele and has made the Green Group the top-rated accounting and tax firm in the thoroughbred business. For a confidential and complimentary consultation, contact us at 732-634-5100 or visit our website at www.greenco.com. The Green Group, proven strategies to save you taxes. Here in Pennsylvania, we're proud of our breeding program, the best in North America, but we're also proud to be leaders in this industry. The PA Horse Breeders Association is funding cutting-edge research at Penn Vet to detect gene doping in thoroughbreds, and we endorsed the SAFE Act to help protect the most vulnerable horses. 
Plus, we're pleased to support the aftercare programs set up by our horsemen's groups. Just a few of the reasons why you should join us in Pennsylvania, the premier place to breed and race. The TD and Riders Room is also brought to you by the Pennsylvania Horse Breeders Association, the PHBA. Horses already nominated for the 2023 two year old Pennsylvania Styred, Pennsylvania Bred Stallion Series are now live on the PHBA website, but it's not too late to nominate your two year old. In fact, if you do this before March 31st, the nomination fee is only $500. After that, it goes up to $1,000. So now is the time to learn more and get involved. You can visit pabred.com com for more information. So we have on the show now the fastest horse of the week. I want to introduce a new segment this week only, the dumbest criminal in horse racing. And the slam dunk inaugural winner of the dumbest criminal in horse racing goes to Ron Paolucci. Uh, those of you who follow the Ohio circuit, the guy would win races by the dozens at uh, uh, Mahoning Valley, Beulah Park, River Downs, et cetera. He actually was also the part owner of a filly that won the 2013 Breeders' Cup Juvenile Phillies uh, via disqualification. So it came out last week that he has pled guilty to two counts of tax fraud and tax evasion. He's facing up to eight years in prison. And here's what Ron did. Um, and you don't have to say alleged because he, he's pled guilty to it. From 2014, 2020, uh, he took the withdrawals, uh, with, uh, the withholdings out of his employees' paychecks for taxes, Social Security, et cetera, and basically put the money in his pocket, $13 million. On top of that, he failed to report his own income and Jip tried to get away with uh, making $17 million uh, dollars that he didn't pay any taxes on. And the reason I call him the dumbest criminal is because if you're going to commit a crime, have some chance of getting away with it, would you please? Did he really think the IRS was not going to figure this out? Oh, you took $13 million out of your pay, employees' paychecks, and we never saw a penny of it. Oh, you know. Anyways, um, I don't really know the guy. He was a little bit of a loud mouth, I think it's fair to say. He complained in 2018, said he was getting out of racing, then didn't get out of racing after all. But uh, he is going to be spending some time at the Gray Bar Hotel. Wonder how much of that thirteen million dollars wound up being funneled into the horse business to support Ooh, yeah. to support his stable. You know, we've all seen owners come and go, guys that come in and they and they have these huge stables, and then all of a sudden, seemingly overnight, they just disappear. And ironically, like a month ago, I was looking at some old charts and stuff, and I came across Luch Racing, and I thought, wow, they haven't heard of Ron Palucci in a long time. Wonder what happened to him. Yeah, now you know why. Yeah. Now we know. Yeah, he was a big horse player too. Like he was uh, a big yeah. express, one of their premier players. So a lot of that 13 million, definitely, I can almost guarantee got funneled right back in. So thanks for that, Ron. We appreciate that. that that's great. Give it, give it back. So, we just wish you had gotten it in a different way. Exactly. <laughs> yes, exactly. But thanks. Well, for is there any reason why you can't bet on your ADW from prison? I mean, you know, is there any rules or laws against that? <laughs> Funding might be a problem. Yeah, I would say so. All right, so let's segue to another subject. And uh, those of you who don't follow Steeplechase Racing may not know that much about the Cheltenham Festival, but it is huge. It is the biggest couple of days. It's like Royal Ascot uh, for Steeplechase Racing. I mean, it is absolutely huge. And there were a couple really good stories at Royal Ascot this week. Uh, Zoe and Randy, you guys paid a whole lot more attention to this than I did. So take it away. Go ahead, uh, Zoe. He's, he's already going with Royal Alaska. It was Cheltenham, like Royal Alaska. Um, I mean, the, the main story going in, uh, we'll get to Honeysuckle. Let's, let's start with Constitution Hill first, was Constitution Hill. He is basically the jumping Frankel. If you think that Frankel was undefeated, Constitution Hill is a perfect six for six. Now, hopefully, once we get all the video together, we'll be able to show his last jump where he jumped from the wing. Now, I've been down here at OBS all week, and we watched it on a phone in the grandstand, uh, myself and Dave Hanley. Um, who else was there? Jerry O'Dwyer was there. And someone else. we watched it on the phones, and he was simply amazing. It's almost like Frankel when he won the Guineas. That was his sixth start. This is his sixth start. He is absolutely sensational. And the good thing about Constitution Hill is we can all get behind him or we can talk about this next year and perhaps the year after because he'll go jumping fences next year. He's just a hurdler right now. He was simply 
sublime. Yeah, I got a chance last year, and I don't follow jump racing either, Bill. I got a chance to go to Cheltenham as a guest of Michael Dickinson, who's Mr. Cheltenham, uh, and his wife, Joan Wakefield. And it was, it blew me away. It's unbelievable. It was an experience of a lifetime. Really, it should be on the bucket list of every horse racing fan, whether you follow jump racing or not. And while I was there, I got a chance to see Constitution Hill run last year. And so I've been following him ever since. He's the jump Frankel. He's the jumping flight line. So in the Champions Hurdle Tuesday, opening day at Cheltenham, 60,000 people there on a Tuesday. It's one of the biggest races of the, of the short meeting. And he was running against the, 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 the best jumper in, in Ireland. Very tough competition in the, in the Champions Hurdle. And he won by nine widening lengths. And that was the smallest margin of victory so far in his career. His other margins, 12, 12, 14, 17, and 22 lengths. Now, I know when you're going two miles over fences, you know, the, the, the margins are going to be elongated and spread out and such. But still, I mean, this horse is an absolute freak. And it's good. And, and you talk about height. There was more height before this race than there was flight line before the Breeders' Cup Classic. And this horse really lived up to it. And it was one of the best 60 minutes of racing you will ever see. Because a half hour after Constitution Hill won the champion's hurdle, an eight-year-old mare named Honeysuckle ran the last race of her career. She's the Zenyatta of the jumping set. She started her career 16 for 16, just like Zenyatta. Then she lost two races earlier this year. They wanted her to go out on top. They had one last race. They wanted it to be at Cheltenham. They didn't want to run against Constitution Hill. They'd won that race two years in a row, but they didn't think they could beat Constitution Hill. So they wanted to give her a chance, at least, to go out on top. And Zoe, a, a dramatic victory. Wasn't a dry eye in the house. Owner, trainer, jockey, crying in the winter's enclosure, standing ovations. It's what it, makes horse racing so great. It does. And it gives me chills just thinking about it and thinking honeysuckle. And everyone was all out to retire her off her last race. Everyone was up in arms that they weren't going for another champion hurdle. She's won the champion hurdle twice. And this was her second mare's hurdle. The fact that she's run four years in a row at Cheltenham is, she's a winner already. She was just incredible yesterday. And you know, there was an angel looking back. She's, she's trained by Henry the Bromhead. And a, a lot of people over here stateside might not know the Henry de Bromhead's son, Jack the Bromhead, who was fatally killed last year whilst pony racing at just age 13. Now, they named a race for Jack yesterday, and I was listening to a great interview with Henry de Bromhead this morning on uh, the Nick Luck show, and he said it was like there was an angel looking down. When they were leading her back down the hill, there was a tiny little rainbow at the corner of the grandstand. Wow. Just, just gives me chills. It, it was a fabulous day of racing, but that was the pinnacle. Yes, they would love to have little Jack back, and it was just a shame, but it was a fantastic day of racing. It could not possibly have gone any better for Heather and Henry de Bromhead. Really, my heart goes out to them for what they went through, but Honeysuckle sure as hell made it all better yesterday. The TDN Writers' Room is brought to you by XBTV, and oh boy, what a tool it is. The XBTV work of the week is Sibelius, who worked in 48 and 4 last Friday at Gulfstream, the five-year-old train by Jerry O'Dwyer. I've been sitting next to him all morning here at OBS. Is already in Dubai after winning his last two starts, including the grade three Mr. Prospector. He will go forward in the Dubai Golden Shaheen. We get a little bit of everything here on the TDN Writers Room, according to Jerry, Wednesday morning. He ate up everything after a long flight over to Dubai. He went out and jogged. They've been training him for the long walks in the sand on the way to the racetrack, and we look forward to seeing him in the Dubai Golden Shaheen on March the 25th. All the thrills. 
fraction of the bills. Experience the power of the partnership. Change your life, make new friends, and compete at the highest level of thoroughbred racing. West Point Thoroughbreds, the gold standard in racing partnerships. Visit westpointtb.com. The TDN Writers' Room is brought to you by West Point Thoroughbreds. Joining West Point Thoroughbreds can literally vault you right into the winner's circle for a fraction of the cost of trying to do it on your own. For more information, go to westpointtb.com. Now, West Point had their latest winner on Friday with Accidental Hero, who broke his maiden for Steve Asperson at Turfway. I'm at OBS. We've seen a couple of days of breeze shows. We've got one more tomorrow on Thursday, and we're just about to get started. West Point will be here. Terry Finley is walking the grounds as we speak. If you'd like any information on syndication, contact Debbie Finley at Debbie at WestPointTB.com. So speaking of OBS, that factored into the Remy Balop cartoon this week. And he's got a horse that is behind everybody else in the stretch and the Owner and trainer are kind of giving each other a look and says, well, we know we'll never lose a one furlong race. For all those who have spent millions on a horse, after going only one furlong, it's a risky game. A lot of people are good at it, but sometimes it can backfire. So that's this week's Remy cartoon. Uh, well, guys, as you know, I've been at OBS and they got a new track here at OBS for the first time. Randy, you mentioned Michael Dickinson, so you've obviously heard of his to Peter Footings. That's laid down here in OBS, and I can honestly say I've never seen a fairer kind of surface that's laid down. We've had fast times, we've had good times, and we've had a safe breeze show thus far. So kudos to OBS for getting in probably one of the best tracks in the nation here. It's going to be a fantastic week. All right, Zoe, you stay warm down there and bundle up in Florida. Again, it looks like this is OBS at the North Pole. Anyways, everybody, thanks so much for tuning us in this week. We'll be back next week on the TDN Writers Room Podcast.